Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president. I had the privilege of being the president of the C.S. Lewis Society of California. I want to welcome you all to our um, wonderful program this evening. We're quite privileged to have Lawrence Harwood with us. Um, the topic tonight is C.S. Lewis, My Godfather, An Evening with Lawrence Harwood. And I think you're going to greatly enjoy it. For those of you who are new to the uh, Lewis Society, hopefully you've got a packet. And you'll find in there information about tonight's, tonight's program, as well as information about the Lewis Society itself. We invite you to become a member of the Society. Uh, just to give you a, lot, a little background, uh, the Lewis Society was started about six years ago. It's an education, Christian educational and cultural organization interested in advancing deeper understanding of the life works and ideas of C.S. Lewis and others who are addressing the enduring philosophical, cultural, historical, literary, theological, social, economic, and related issues. Quite a mouthful. But in doing so, we are specifically trying to stimulate and advance public interest in the ideas, the works, and life of, of C.S. Lewis. Uh, we promote both popular and scholarly study and writing on the topics. We sponsor and organize programs like tonight. Uh, we also are involved in co-sponsoring film premieres and stage productions um, and other venues such as debates and so forth. And we try to network with other organizations who share part or all of our vision uh, to enter the public square and make a significant di difference on the culture. Um, in the packet, you'll also find information about the uh, Lewis Society Book Club that meets every two weeks. The next book that will be read is Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, uh, which um, I highly recommend. It's one of my favorite of his novels. Um, it's essentially a, sto uh, a book on the afterlife, journey to hell and heaven and so forth. Uh, it's quite, uh, quite an amazing book, and I highly, highly recommend it. We hope that you'll be able to join with us. Also, you'll find on the Lewis Society web pay, website, you'll find information about all of Lewis's books and all of the books about Lewis and topics by many other writers pertaining to this. So you'll find thousands of references, you'll find articles, you'll find interviews, DVDs, CDs, and so on. So um, this evening, uh, we're very pleased to have Lawrence Harwood here. Um, and we've asked him to share with us his recollection of his godfather, C.S. Lewis, the beloved Oxford and Cambridge Don and Christian writer. Uh, Lewis is uh, a very well-known figure. Um, he, he was a best-selling author. Uh, the first half of his life was one in which he was a pretty dedicated atheist, then converted, and really has had a, a, a profound influence on the thinking of many people um, and the cascade is, has been considerable in a whole range of fields. Uh, the book that um, our guest um, is the author of is this one called C.S. Lewis, My Godfather, Letters, Photos, and Recollections, which I hope you get. It's a wonderful, charming book um, of unpublished letters and drawings and many other things from uh, Mr. Harwood's relationship with his godfather, and that will be also part of what he'll be showing tonight um, on PowerPoint. Um, I think that the, the book and what uh, Lawrence will be uh, discussing is really going to give us uh, a really a rare and charming look at a glimpse, in fact, into the life of Lewis and that period and what came out of it. Those of you um, who are familiar with Lewis probably also know that he and J.R.R. Tolkien had a literary society that they started. Uh, it was basically a bunch of friends called the Inklings. Uh, the Inklings met actually a couple times each week, uh, one at a pub and also in Muddlin College at Lewis's quarters. And they would, they would read each other's manuscripts and debate and discuss. And that is where the Lord of the Rings came from and the Chronicles of Narnia and many other works. And they also had a spillover effect not only to the people who were in the, the Inklings, including Lawrence's father, Cecil Harwood, was one of the original members, but also tangentially to people um, including Dorothy Sayers and even T.S. Eliot and others. So as background, um, Lawrence Harwood is a retired chartered land agent and surveyor. 
Uh, his career spans 36 years in the National Trust of the United Kingdom. His work reflects his concern for the well-being of the countryside and the coastline of the United Kingdom. Uh, he has a great interest in lighthouses, for example, and, and so we, we intend to have a discussion about that. You may have noticed the uh, logo of the Independent Institute is a lighthouse. Um, in 1996, he was awarded the Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, his parents, I mentioned his father Cecil and his mother Daphne, were two of, of Lewis's closest and longtime friends. Um, and it's, uh, they live in uh, Grasmere, United Kingdom. So I'm very pleased to introduce Lawrence Harwood. Thank you very much, David. And may I also say, to start with, thank you, Mary, if she's around, because Mary, David's wonderful wife, is accommodating us foreigners in her abode at the top of the hill tonight. <laughs> and that's a wonderful experience which we're going to have once this terrifying ordeal is over. <laughs> <clears throat> I think I should start, perhaps, by explaining a bit more what David himself has already talked about, namely how it was that I became the godson of C.S. Lewis. Can you all hear me at the back? That's the most important thing. A hand went up, my wife's, which must mean you can't. <laughs> a bit louder. OK. I think this is supposed to be a loudspeaker, but never mind. Um, my father, who was called Cecil Harwood, um, he put he <laughs> uh, There's something more about that later in my talk I'll tell you about. Um, he joined the army in the First World War and came out of that at, in 1919 and went to Christchurch College, Oxford, which subsequently I've been to and my younger brother, Mark, has also been there. And he went there with his great school friend, Owen Barfield, whose name may well be known to some of you as a wonderful literary gentleman, a writer of books, who went to school with my father in Highgate School, North London, and they became lifelong friends with each other. In November of the year 1919, Owen Barfield introduced my father, Cecil, to Jack Lewis, who was at University College, Oxford. Owen Barfield had been at Wadham, and my father was at Christchurch, and another member of Christchurch had just walked into the room, I've noticed. A welcome member of Christchurch. <laughs> Um, Lewis himself refers to his first meeting with my father in the book he wrote about Surprised by Joy, in which he says about my father, he was closely linked to Barfield of Wadham, and he was Owen Barfield's friend, and soon mine. A.C. Harwood, who was a pillar of Michael Hall, the Steinerite school in Sussex, and an anthroposophist, he was different from either of us a wholly imperturbable man. Though poor, like most of us, and wholly without prospects, he wore the expression of a 19th century gentleman with something in the funds. On a walking tour, which of course they all love to do, when the last light of a wet evening had just revealed some ghastly error in map reading, probably his own, and the best hope was five miles to Mudham if we could find it, and we might get beds there, he still wore that expression. In the heat of argument, he wore it still. You would think that he, if anyone, would have been told to take that look off his face. But I don't believe he ever was. It was no mask and came from no stupidity. He has been tried since by all the usual sorrows and anxieties. He is the sole Horatio known to me in this age of Hamlet's, no stop for fortune's finger. Now, if I press this middle button, you should see a picture, I'm told. It's not happening, but um, I do my best. <laughs> Is it? I pointed to that, do I? Ah, oh, magic, wonderful. Here is Lewis and his brother Warney in Northern Ireland in Ulster bicycled together. I just love the stance of Lewis like this. And I remember him standing a bit like that. He was a much, much older man when he came to visit our family. But that's all tip. 
Beg your pardon? He's the shorter of the two, the younger. Warney, the older brother, is, is larger and longer. <laughs> During the next several months after their meeting, Lewis and Barfield together, with, with other kindred spirits, including my father, and his special friends, Eric Beckett and Captain Walter Field, met frequently in each other's college rooms to discuss poetry and ideas. What my father wrote later about Captain Field in that group applied equally to every one of them. He said he read poetry as he read life for its meaning and without what Chaucer calls high sentence. The beauty of sound and imagery had little effect on him. They also read and criticized each other's poems and as such were the early precursors of the Inklings, a small informal circle, as Davis described, who vigorously championed the romantic movement and spirit. The poems they wrote had a musicality, an imaginative core about them, which were in strong contrast to the kind of poetry which was then fashionable. They were all great walkers, and much later in 1943, Lewis wrote to Field, Captain Field, the whole point about the walk is that all the members of it are unlike and indispensable. Owen's dark, labyrinthine, pertinacious arguments, my bow-wow dogmatism, Cecil's unmoved tranquility, your needle-like or greyhound keenness are four instruments in a quartet. The thing is an image of what the world ought to be, wedded unlikes. Roll on the day when it can function again. And function it did. As this letter from Jack Lewis makes clear, that is Jack with his father, on his, presumably um, um, around in, in the 20s, I imagine, and they're discussing his father, of course, was a clergyman in Belfast, Ulster, Northern Ireland. And there is Owen Barfield, whom I've also mentioned, who was a wonderful man, a great wordsmith, and wrote some wonderful books, and was, in Lewis's opinion, the most um, influential man on his thinking uh, of any he had met. And I'll speak more about that later. And there is Lewis when, when he gets to Oxford, rather elegantly attired. So Lewis used to go off and discover places where they might go for these walks. And I have here a letter he wrote very early on to my father to tell him he had become the lord of the walks. He said, I'm instructed to inform you, I'll show you this letter in a minute, I'm instructed to inform you that at a meeting of the walks committee held yesterday in the rooms of the Union Society Oxford, the following resolutions were passed. That Mr. A.C. Harwood be created lord of the walks with all few dallases appertaining thereto. And there follows some Latin. <laughs> which includes the high justice, the middle, and the low. The second point of the petition was that a petition be presented to the said Lord of the Walks on behalf of us vassals, requesting permission to commute those feudalities for a rent or money payment. The said vassals to be declared in return free and delivered from all such services as the said feudalities imply. It's estimated that the cost would be between five and six pounds that the following rescript or subcommittee for ethical problems be forward to said Lord, that is, as a moral duty of the Lord for the walks to grant the petition of his vassals for the commu commutation of the feudalities, and that the walk shall begin on Friday, April the 17th, from Hay, and return to Hay through both Ryada and Northern uh, and New Radna, which are on the borders of, of Wales. Now, he then illustrated as he did in those days, his request with a rather lovely sketch at the bottom. And you'll see there that this shows the vassals, including Lewis himself, with either rucksacks or angels' wings on their back, I don't know which, uh, praying that my father would accept, rather like my father that picture actually, uh, <laughs> would expect the duty of being the lord of the walks. <laughs> Now, walking was a favourite pastime of my father, and he used often to tell us of the joy he took from the companionship of friends like Lewis and Barfield on those occasions. 
and from time to time they would travel to other parts of the country to explore it. And a letter from Lewis to my father in 1932 describes the discovery of a cottage that he'd found near Hastings. That, incidentally, is a typical picture of the group of walkers altogether. The extreme left-hand side is my father, grinning with spectacles. Then that Jack Lewis himself with a pork pie hat on his head and well wrapped up. Captain Field, whom I mentioned before, in the background with a, a nice little moustache. The other two I haven't yet identified. So if anybody can offer uh, suggestions, I'd be very pleased to hear. What? Does he? Oh, good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, now, what Lewis said was, my dear Harwood, and please note they speak to each other in these days with the surname. More of that anon. The cottage is called French Court. It's at Pet, about four miles from Hastings. The terms are two guineas a week. The sanitation is outdoor, but aqueous, not terrine. <laughs> the housefrau, Miss Kahn, is rather an old maid, but feeds you excellently. She's very mean about firing, but contrarywise, you have permission to gather firewood for yourself in the woods and behind the house and two rather pleasant forage journeys in the day give a racy practical flavor to your woodland walk and mystically incorporate you from mere tripperhood into the body of rural life. That'll keep you warm. And the beds are soft, level and clean, water, sparingly supplied, you can get as much as you like for yourself from the pond at the back of the cottage. <laughs> Miss C converts this pond water into drinking water by the process of straining it through muslin, <laughs> which I take it removes something, nothing save what is beneficial. In my morning's washing water, I looked down, and oh, happy living things, I said, and blessed them unawares. <laughs> By the way, the drinking water may come from a separate well. I rely on our made statement about the muslin and on conjecture for its pond origin. But the cottage is beautiful, the wood heavenly, the beach about half a mile away, and stony and flat. So that's typical of the sort of letter. And now they had got on to Christian name terms by now. Um, and I should imagine that Lewis, uh, at the period I'm talking about, must have looked much like that, rather an elegant young man. And uh, David, it's interesting that you should pronounce my father's name Cecil, because once they started speaking to each other as Cecil and Jack, which is what he always wanted to be called, um, Jack wrote to my father after that event and said, my dear Cecil, there's one point in favor of pronouncing it that way, your way, namely that Trestle has really no other rhyme. <laughs> Whereas Thistle has whistle, epistle, and gristle. <laughs> Things are like that, he said. However, not to be outdone, my father, I noticed, had penciled in the margin of that letter the words wrestle, pestle, and nestle. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis became a regular visitor to our house and used to write the most charming thank you letters to my mother, Daphne Harwood. In one of these, he expresses some jealousy of the fact that Owen Barfield and my father had walked together without him. He said, I hope you will both come over and lunch. Barfield seems able to walk with you. You, happy man, are the common theme of walking, whereon he and I are but alternative variations. <laughs> the one remains. My conversation with B, as Barfield, revealed the many slanders you have uttered against me. I am always being told that you say I say so and so, which I never said at all and that you say you didn't say what I truly say you said. <laughs> this was a great scandal in the etymological sense of a stumbling block or a fendicle. I am a chewed string, a rung floor cloth, an extenuated kipper, at present cold, cough, wakeful nights, bad dreams, inferiority complex, bad reviews, unable to write. 
Now the friends were not only keen on walking, but they, were loved, they loved opera. And they wanted to go in 1934 to listen to Wagner's Ring at the Royal Opera House in London. Barfield initially was asked to get the tickets for that, but for some reason he wasn't able to do so, so that my father was given that duty. And it's pretty obvious from three letters which I shall now read, which I think are masterly in the way they uh, chastise my father, that he failed to get the tickets. The first letter reads, and I think I think I may have it here. Uh, that, by the way, is a group of them. On the left is Owen Barfield, and then comes Jack Lewis, then my father and mother. And that's on Hilltop somewhere in Sussex, I think. This letter is the first letter about the opera ticket. She said, dear Harwood, note it's reverted to the surname. It is vain to conceal from you the solicitude we feel for our seats at Covent Garden. Pray, pray, sir, exert yourself. Reflect that no small part of the satisfaction of five persons depends upon your conduct. <laughs> that the object of their desires is rational and innocent and that their desires are fervent and of long standing. Omit no manly degree of importunity and complacence that may achieve our object, and thus, my dear sir, give me one more reason to subscribe myself your most obliged, most obedient servant, C.S. Lewis. <laughs> Pretty clear my father had to admit that he failed to get the tickets, because the second of these three letters starts like this. Sir, <laughs> I have read your pathetical letter <laughs> with such sentiments as it naturally suggests, and I write to assure you that you need expect from me no ungenerous reproach. It would be cruel if it were possible, and impossible if it were attempted, to add to the mortification which you must now be supposed to suffer. <laughs> Where I cannot console, it is far from my purpose to aggravate, for it is part of the complicated misery of your state that while I pity your sufferings, I cannot innocently wish them lighter. <laughs> he would be no friend to your reason or your virtue who would wish you to pass over so great a miscarriage in heartless frivolity or brutal insensibility. As the loss is inevitable, so your remorse will be lasting. <laughs> As those whom you have betrayed are your friends, so your conduct admits of no exculpation. As you were once virtuous, so now you must be forever miserable. <laughs> far be from me that that far be from me that ferocious virtue which would remind you that the trust was originally transferred from Barfield to you in the hope of better things, and that thus both our honours were engaged. I will not paint to you the consequence of your conduct, which are doubtless daily and nightly before your eyes. <laughs> Believe me, my dear sir, that I forgive you. But then this last paragraph, I think, is the best of all. As soon as you can, pray let me know through some respectable acquaintance what plans you frame for the future. In what quarter of the globe do you intend to sustain that irrevocable exile, hopeless penury, and perpetual disgrace to which you have condemned yourself? <laughs> Do, do not give in to the sin of despair. Learn from this example the fatal consequences of error and hope in some humbler station and some distant land that you may yet become useful to your species. There's a third letter, <laughs> which reads, Sir, your resolution of seeing me and receiving my forgiveness face to face before you forever quit these shores does not displease me. 
as you have rightly judged, to admit you to my house would now be an offence against the grand principle of subordination, but you'll be welcome to the grounds. You will please to observe the strictest propriety of behaviour while you remain there and to be guided in everything by the direction of Mr Barfield. <laughs> Under his protection, I doubt not that you will be able to achieve the journey without any great disaster or indecency. <laughs> Do not hold any communication with your fellow travellers in the steam train without his approval. And where you bait, you had best abstain from all use of fermented liquors. Many things lawful in themselves are to be denied to one who dare not risk a further miscarriage. <laughs> <laughs> Above all, do not attempt to save your guinea by travelling under the seat, nor to shorten your journey by any approaches to familiarity with your female fellow passengers, and do not bring with you any musical instrument. Your obedient service. Well, I hope that, that, that these exchanges will give you something of the flavour of my father's relationship with Lewis. <laughs> he became a regular um, visitor to our house in London prior to the war where we lived, and then in Somerset in, in England during the war while we were there, and after the war in Sussex. And during these visits, he became a very good friend of my mother's as well as my father. And they entered into some quite serious conversations with each other. As a consequence of which, Lewis occasionally wrote letters to my mother on a number of subjects, including this one on the business of being in love, which I shall read to you. I think it's interesting. He says, this is March 1942, he wrote this letter. Um, my view of being in love is that... Like everything except God and the devil, it is better than some things and worse than others. Then it comes on my scale of values higher than lust, selfishness or frigidity, but lower than charity or constancy. In fact, about on a level with friendship. Like everything except God and the devil, it therefore is sometimes opposed to things lower than itself and is in that situation good, sometimes to things higher than itself and in that situation, bad. <laughs> Thus, being in love is a better motive for marriage than, say, worldly advancement. But the intention to obey God's will by entering into an indissoluble partnership in all virtue and mutual charity for the preservation of chastity and the admission of new souls to the chance of eternal life is better even than being in love. So far, it is plain sailing. That's what he says. Um, the trouble arises when poets and others set up this thing, good in certain conditions with its own proper degree of goodness, as an absolute, which many do. An innocent and well-intentioned emphasis on the importance of being in love with one's spouse, i.e. its superiority over lust or ambition for a basis, as a basis for marriage, is in fact widely twisted into the doctrine that only being in love sanctifies marriage and that therefore as soon as you are tired of your spouse you get a divorce. Thus, thus the overpraising of a finite good, the pretense that it is absolute, defeats itself and corrupts the very good it set out to exalt. And what, become, what begins by wanting to go beyond the prayer book idea of marriage ends by reducing marriage to mere concubinage. Treat love as a god and you in fact make it a fiend. And as to fate, which I call providence, I believe that the coming together of a man and a woman, like everything else, for example the fall of a sparrow, is in the hand of God. In our society, the matter is usually displayed in the form of mutual falling in love. In the society to which our Lord spoke about one flesh, this was not so. Marriages were usually arranged by parents, and so in the vast majority of cases and places. I therefore cannot make falling in love the universal necessary precondition. We must always no doubt support it as against any inferior one, but against any other one, but not against any other one in general. And this is where I get mentioned at long last. <laughs> <laughs>
As for God's son, Lawrence, if and when he asks my views on the matter, a not very likely scene, of course I must tell him what I think. I, I was nine at the time. Now I'm going to show a picture of a Dutchman just to keep you interested in, in some, something of the future while I read out a few more letters. I was born in, in 1933 and christened in October of that year, this same month as now. And Jack Lewis must have been present on that occasion because when he wrote to my mother in December 1933, he said, I hope you've not in misinterpreted my long silence. I have the most grateful memories of my last weekend with you and value the novel humour of my god Sibby very much. How is my godson? I hope his laughing all through the christening service does not mean that he's going to grow up an esprit fort. But as soon as he's old enough, I shall try to collaborate you with you in preventing this. He became a very jovial visitor and regular one to our households. And I remember still the excitement of his arrival, his presence, the laughter and the bonhomie it created in the house. Starting very often first thing in the morning with his booming voice, emerging from the only bathroom we had in those days, saying, bathroom free! <laughs> and insisting on an early morning swim, if possible, in our local lake during the summer months before breakfast. He'd be talking all the time to my father, mostly on philosophical topics way above my head. But he liked to do a kind of a belly flop into the lake. Um, and I was convinced he spoke underwater. Because when his head emerged quite often, the words he was uttering would be several stages along the line of his thought. So he must therefore have been talking underwater, I think. <laughs> uh, much of what he was talking about, of course, was above my head. But the frisson and the excitement of having him in the house was something I well recall. And he was wonderful at playing with much younger people. It said he wasn't very good with children. I don't think that was my experience. I was one of five children in the middle. And used to come and get down on the floor and play whatever games we were playing at our level, not in any sense in a patronising way, but just to feel what it was like to be our age and to enjoy the things we were enjoying. So that was a wonderful memory of him as a kind visitor and godfather. He took pains to be an assiduous godfather, as is clear from his correspondence with my mother. Here, for example, on the 6th of January 1939, um, my mother just returned from Jamaica, uh, where her father, uh, Lord Olivia, had been governor. And he writes to her, as a bachelor who has seldom even talked to children, I should be very foolish if I gave any advice as to books for Lawrence. If I felt qualified to choose books, I should send books and not book tokens. I have in my possession some wonderful Fiden art books as a consequence of him sending book tokens every Christmas to me. But John, that's my older brother, he's right about rum. It has a romantic interest. I think my mother had offered him some on the returning from Jamaica. It is one of those things which gives us a sensuous and an imaginative pleasure all at once. And the only reason why I'm going to refuse your very tempting offer of a bottle, or was it a keg? Do say, <laughs> do, do say it was a keg, or was it a noggin? of rum is that it is your positive wifely duty to see that Cecil drinks it all. If he turns coy and altruistic and says, as men will say anything, that he doesn't care for rum, you may reply lightly in the Latin tongue, hoc est omnis mens oculus, which means that's all my eye. <laughs> He's not forgotten, surely, dancing through the streets of Caerleon with a bottle of white rum in one hand and his cutlass in the other. Of course, for domestic purposes, the question should be put more nakedly, convivial. Some proper pretext about wet feet, overwork, or the like, will do gentle violence to his coyness. But you mourn a blains, give it to the good man. Now, once I was capable of writing to him in an infantile way, we had a long correspondence which went on for the whole of his life until his death, um, and he began to write to me in wonderful letters, some of which I shall share with you, which he was able somehow or other to pitch at the level that he knew I had attained in my um, development, which I thought was remarkable. Um, here's one. My dear Lawrence, thank you very much for writing me such a nice Christmas letter. It's very cold here, but I've not got so many colds as usual this year. 
and this is one that this belongs to. The reason for this is because I've got a very a pick a very very thick pair of corduroy trousers, so thick they make me look like a Dutchman or a sailor. I live in a college, which is something rather like a castle and also like a church. It stands beside a bridge over a river. At the back of the part I live in, there's a nice grove of trees. There are lots of rabbits there. One very old rabbit is so tame that it will run after me and take things out of my hand. I call her Baroness Biscuit because she's a kind of biscuit color. There are also stags and deer. The stags I cannot draw because their horns, which are called antlers, are too hard to draw. They often fight at night, and if I lie awake, I hear the noise, click, click it goes, of their horns tapping together. So here I sit all day long, writing books and setting examination papers and answering letters. Sometimes we kill a deer to eat. The meat is called venison. Tell Daddy it is unrationed. And I got a great big help helping smoking hot the other night. I did enjoy myself, but I wish he'd been there. I'm writing a story with a bear in it at present. The bear is going to get married in the last chapter, and there are also angels in it. But sometimes I don't think it's going to be very good. I'm sorry you don't like cold weather. I do. I love to see the frost, all sugar on the grass, and when it makes the fire burn bright. I'm sending you something in f to get as a Christmas box with love to the family, Jack Lewis. I used to love getting these letters. You can see that was pitched to me at a fairly low level, and they progressed as I had to progress too. Here's one he wrote to me in January 1946, which has some nice images in it. That's what the total letter looked like that I received from him with these marginal drawings, Beatrix Potter-like, um, showing them for me. And this is the next letter he wrote. We are having very sharp frosts here. The pond is frozen over, but not thick enough for skating yet. Our dog Bruce, who is very old and white-haired now, feels the cold very badly and has to be wrapped up in a blanket at night. He looks very funny in it. Yesterday, the man who lives next door to us came into our garden and when we went looking and cut down one of our trees. He said it had an elm disease and was spoiling his garden. But as he took the wood away with him, I call it stealing, and we are very angry. <laughs> he is an old man with a white beard who eats nothing but raw vegetables. He used to be a schoolmaster. That's a, that's a dig to my father, who was a schoolmaster. <laughs> he keeps goats who also have white beards and eat nothing but raw vegetables. <laughs> if I knew magic, I should like to turn him into a goat himself. It wouldn't be so very wicked because he's so like a goat already. <laughs> Don't you think it would serve him right? But I suppose he would then come over and eat the bark of the trees instead of cutting them down, so we'd be no better off. The other thing I might do is to challenge him to a duel, but I suppose he's too old to fight. And anyway, I'm not much good at fencing. Have you ever learned fencing? I think it would be nice. A few weeks ago, I went into an inn near Oxford where the landlady gave homemade ginger biscuits free with the cider. Do you wish you'd been there, or don't you like them? The stars have been very bright recently. This house, the kilns that is, which David knows well, and others here perhaps, this house is so funnily built that I have to go up to my bedroom by an outside stairway in the open air. As I go up, Sirius, very bright and green, looks as if he was sitting just on the top rail. And then when I reach the top, I see the whole of Orion. Orion, Cassiopeia, and the Plough are the only constellations I can be sure of picking out. Do you know any more? I like Orion the best. I hope you'll get a book token I sent you, but don't bother replying if you have too many other letters to write. I have to write about seven letters a day all the year round. Isn't that dreadful? So I must stop this one now and begin the next. All love and good wishes to you and the others for 1946. Now that reveals that letter a lot. First of all, he's beginning to ask questions of me, his godson, as though I knew the answers better than he did. That's typical of the way he used to 
treat me. He'd ask, his, he'd ask my advice on issues that he knew far more than I ever did. And the other thing, it reveals how much correspondence he had. Seven handwritten letters a day, all in fountain pen with ink. I've got some copies of the ones I'm, I'm talking about if you want to see them afterwards. And I reckon there's over 100,000 letters. That's a lot of ink, a lot of paper, a lot of work, a lot of time. And it's rather remarkable that alongside that, he also wrote so many books and other works as well. Here's another letter which um, I had in August. This is a picture of Lewis looking rather older outside Headington Church. He says in August the 26th, 1946, we've been trying to get some French servants. So we put an advertisement in a French paper and these were the replies. They were all in French, of course, and some of them were very funny. Many of the girls made quite as many mistakes in French grammar as you or I would. By the way, the French call a servant a bun and speak it bon. I would like to see you in your canoe. Do you use a single or a double paddle? I've not had much swimming this year because it has been so cold here, but I think swimming is the nicest kind of exercise there is. I think standing, just standing, the nastiest. <laughs> and he goes on to talk about to toadstools and things like that. He had the knack of making his letters interesting to a young boy, including setting puzzles. Um, for example, he wrote a letter here saying, nothing much has happened to me except that I saw a rabbit yawn. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose people who keep tame ones have seen it often, but this was a wild rabbit and I thought it a very curious sight. It was a very bored, triangular yawn in the middle of a long, hot afternoon. I've also, he says, been rereading Kipling's Just So stories and have translated all the runes around that picture of the tusk that there is as a frontispiece of that book, which many of you may know. In case you don't know the runic alphabet, which is a useful secret writing and supposed to have magical results, it is as follows. I can't describe this because he then puts in his letter his own secret definition of the runes and continues the letter partly in that secret writing and partly in his own. And he ends up, I expect you'll be able to read the runic parts of this letter, but not those that I've written myself in English. And so he tried to test you in that way. He also tested one later on um, on, on a mathematical puzzle. He said he had decided views on books and writing to me in December 1948, he records his hatred of Dickens as a boy and his envy of my father having business abroad. He said, I hated Dickens as a boy. I think the illustrations put me off. Long before I could read, I used to turn them over and over as picture books, not liking them, indeed rather frightened by them, but fascinated. The very smell of that edition, you've noticed, that every book has its peculiar smell. In fact, the smell of some books next to that of new shoes is one of the best smells there is, I think. The very smell of that edition had a sort of horror about it. Luckily, I've got over it now, and I was re-reading Pickwick just before Christmas, but I've never gone back to Oliver Twist. Would you advise me to? <laughs> Great Expectations is one of the best. And then he goes on, I've just read a curious medieval method of prov proving your answer to multiplication sum, and I'm wondering if anyone at your school can explain why it works. I won't go into the detail, but he has that there in the letter. Now, changing the subject a little bit, my mother, it was found out in May 1950, was, had severe cancer, and the diagnosis was not good and there are some touching letters that I've found to my father um, about this, which in a way uh, are unusual to, to find because they're perhaps a slight premonition of his own fate when Joy Davidson, his own wife later on, this is a long time before he was married to her, uh, suffered the same fate. The first one reads as follows. My dear Harwood, I heard your terrible news from John, that's my older brother. My older brother John was a pupil of his at Magdalen College, Oxford. So that's how he'd heard it. I had hoped that you at least, you who a load of my friends always seem to me, in any full sense of that word, happy, might be left so. 
you have been in that sense such a rock to us all, strong and solid. And I'm sure you will be still, but I hoped that this mode would not be exacted. I have nothing to say. This letter is only a substitute for a look or a touch. I suppose all that mere friends can do is to prevent, if they can do even that, one very minor byproduct of sorrow, the sense of isolation from the whole world of one's old world, the feeling that all else goes on the same. Believe me, it does not. Please give my dear love to Daphne. Then another letter followed when there appeared to be some hope that um, t there would be a remission. He says, in May 1950, it is the apparent strength of my craft and the apparent lightness of yours that make me so vividly aware of the stout captain in the one and the mere bellman, hunting of the snark bellman, in the other. One of the byproducts of your news was to fill me with shame at the rattled condition in which I then was about troubles quite nugatory compared with yours. My hand, such as it is, and so far as it can be, is always in yours and Daphne's. It is terrible to think, and yet how did one ever forget it, that unless in rare circumstances of simultaneous accident, every marriage ends in something like this. God bless you all. And a further letter on the subject followed. Um, I can imagine, he says, the heart-rending pathos of this increasing hope and have often wondered whether our preference in art for the tragic over the pathetic is not partly due to cowardice, that the pathetic is unbearable. Still, one's frail agonies of pity and tenderness don't fester and corrode in memory as the opposites would. Still love to you both. I wish it were of better quality. I am a hard, cold, black man inside, and in my life have not wept enough. I often thought that it was a strange chance that it was some years later that Jack himself had to go through all this with his own wife. His letters to my father were not based on personal experience of such tragedy at that time, although he'd lost his mother when he was 10 years old. And um, it's because partly that the Shadowlands play and film, which some of you may have seen about that period of his life with Joy Davidson, seemed to me an in inadequate portrayal of uh, Lewis as a human being that, encouraged by my wife, I decided to write the little book that some of you may have um, foolishly purchased. <laughs> um, <laughs> and to do talks like this because I felt that there may not be many people left around who actually knew him as a human being and as a friend as a godfather. And I can only speak of him from that direction. I don't want any questions afterwards on deeply philosophical points, please. Let's make that point. <laughs> Soon after all this, my mother did die, and in 1952, I was to go up to Christchurch myself to read history under the stern direction of Hugh Trevor Roper, who was my history don at the time. But after a year, as people in this room will know, when you have to do your prelims in order to carry on, I failed with that. I had been ill with double pneumonia, and as a consequence, wasn't able to pass them. Nor did I think, really, I was cut out to be an academic person. It led to a new direction in my, in my career, as I shall describe, but at the time, I thought the world had fallen in. My father had been an academic, my, he was a teacher, my brother had been to Oxford and read literature, and my godfather, of course, was a don at Oxford, and I thought I'd let them all down badly. I then, th to my delight, comes this letter from Jack Lewis in August 1953, and I must read this to you because it's the most wonderful comfort letter, um, as I think you'll agree. I was sorry to hear from Owen Barfield that you've taken a nasty knock over prelims. Sorry, because I know it can't be much fun for you. Not because I think the thing is necessarily a major disaster. We are now so used to the examination system that we hardly remember how very recent it is and how hotly it was opposed by some quite sensible people. 
Trollope, no fool, was utterly sceptical about its value. And I myself, I myself, though a don, sometimes wonder how many of the useful or even the great men of the past would have survived it. It does not test all qualities by any means, not even all qualities needed in an academic life. And anyway, what a small part of life that is. And if you are not suited for that, it is well to have been pushed forcibly out at an early stage rather than a later stage. It is much worse to waste three or more years getting a fourth or a pass. You can now cut your losses and start on something else. At the moment, I can well imagine everything seems in ruins. That's an illusion. The world is full of capable and useful people who began their life by ploughing its exams. You will laugh at this contretemps some day. Of course, it would be disastrous to go to the other extreme and conclude that one was a genius because he had failed in a prelim. As if a horse imagined it must be a derby winner because it couldn't be taught to pull a four-wheeler. But I don't expect that that is the extreme to which you are temperamentally inclined. Are you in danger of seeking consolation in resentment? I have no reason to suppose you are, but it is a favourite device of the human mind, certainly of mine, and one wants to be on one's guard against it. And that is about the only way in which an early failure like this can become a real permanent injury. A belief that one has been misused, a tendency ever after to snap and snarl at the system. That, I think, makes a man always a bore, usually an ass, sometimes a villain. So don't, either, don't think either that you are no good or that you are a victim. Write the whole thing off and get on. You may reply, it's easy talking. I shan't blame you if you do. I remember only too well what a hopeless oyster to be opened the world seemed to be at your age. I would have given a good deal to anyone who could have assured me that I ever could be able to persuade anyone to pay me a living wage for anything I could do. I, life consisted of applying for jobs which other people got, writing books that no one would publish, and giving lectures which no one attended. It all looks hopelessly hopeless, yet the vast majority of us managed to get on somehow and shake down somewhere in the end. You are now going through what most people, at least most of the people I know, find in retrospect to have been the most unpleasant period of their lives. But it won't last. The road usually improves later. I think life is rather like a bumpy bed in a bad hotel. <laughs> At first, you can't imagine how you can lie on it, much less sleep in it. But presently, one finds the right position, and finally, one is snoring away. By the time one is called, it seems a very good bed, and one is loath to leave it. And then he finally says, this is a very stodgy letter. There's no need to bother answering it. Well, it was not a very stodgy letter. It was the one that sort of redeemed my belief in myself in a kind of a way. And it came as a huge comfort and also reassurance. Because to tell the truth, I was fairly ashamed of having failed my prelims for the first year at Oxford. And in the event, it led me to a completely new direction in my life because I decided, with the help of um, him and my parents, to to turn to a training in land agency, as David mentioned, and I went to the Royal Agricultural College in uh, Gloucestershire uh, for three-year training in that. And only many, many years later did I discover that Lewis had paid the whole of the fees for those three years courses at that college. My parents were not very well off, and he he had a trust fund which he kept at arm's length and which was administered by his friend Owen Barfield and he entrusted her in Barfield to make sure the money went to the sort of causes he would uh, uh, approve of, and, and mine was one. So I owe him a huge amount for that. In December 1953, I had my first letter from him indicating um, the arrival of Joy Davidman into his life. 
he writes as follows. We've had an American lady, ha ha, staying in, <laughs> staying in the house with her sons, the eldest nine and a half. Phew! But you've had younger brothers, so you know what it's like. We didn't. We do now. <laughs> Very pleasant, but like surf bathing, leaves one rather breathless. breathless. And there he is with joy uh, on the wall of uh, the kilns. And four years later, I had taken up my first job uh, as a factor, which is a land agent, in the Scottish Highlands and was living in Inverness. I must have written to him about what I was doing up there. His comments are interesting, and also the fact that he refers in this letter to me uh, about the miraculous temporary recovery of his wife, Joy. December the 12th, 1957. Thank you for your most interesting letter. I envy you your hills and gillies and shepherds. I'm surprised that you're finding the Scotch. Why shouldn't I call them Scotch, even if they don't call themselves so? I call the Francais French, don't I? Less bookish class for class than the English. I'd always thought and have sometimes found them more so. Pipes, that's bagpipes, in the open air give me a strange pleasure, though not perhaps a strictly musical one. More an affair of the nerves. They are the only thing that makes me feel martial ardour. All my news is good. My wife has made an almost miraculous, certainly an unexpected recovery. I myself am quite free from pain now. He'd not been well. And I have to wear a surgical belt rather like the one that your mother and my grandmother used to wear. It's surprising how you get used to it. Now, in 1955, Jack transferred from Magdalen, Oxford, to become a professor at Magdalen, with an E on the end, Cambridge. <clears throat> and by this time, I myself had my first posting with the National Trust. Uh, that's in 1960 I went there, um, working in East Anglia, in the Norfolk area, not far from Cambridge. I therefore had the opportunity quite often to go across and see Jack, in Cambridge, and he quite often invited me to dine at Hall at High Table, which is a frightening experience, I must admit, because you ha you had during the course of an evening um, six different companions. The, the meal was divided into three: soup and so forth, main course and f dessert. And on each occasion, you shifted position, so you had a yet another frightening don sitting either side of you. <laughs> Uh, uh, and I tried to make conversation with him the best I could. But it was a wonderful occasion, and he was always very genial. He put me up in his visitors' quarters, very splendid. Um, and I used to visit him there, and he loved being taken out for a drive. He didn't drive himself. He was too intelligent to drive, I reckon. <laughs> um, and he loved being taken out, for example, to Ely, to the cathedral, and then insisted on a pub lunch afterwards um, in a local bar or pub. And his two stepsons were by then growing up and causing him some concern as to their careers. So that before long, in a kind of a way, our roles were almost reversed. And he began to seek my advice, particularly concerning the older son, Douglas, as to what he might do, possibly in relation to farming or agriculture or land agency. I think I must have helped to find him a place because on the 26th of January 1963, a very severe winter that was, he appears to acknowledge that in a letter which reads, Dear Lawrence, thank all good stars, we've got Douglas with a grinder, that's a tutor, at Godalming. I like the man's letters and he seems to like D. Now, uh, he seems to think that D now at last means business but he's meant it so often before. Thanks very much for all your pains. You are more like a godfather, fairy type, than a godson now. I may bother you about vocational work later on. We don't know any dates yet. We struggle on with the winter. Not all pipes have stood up to it. Do you find it begins to make you very comatose, as if a man were meant to be a hibernating animal? All the best for the new year. It wasn't long that year, 1963, before Jack died on the 22nd of November, the same day as Kennedy was assassinated. 
And until his death, he and my father were constantly exchanging poems that they'd written to each other, as well as with Owen Barfield. And I'd just like to read one that Jack himself actually dedicated to my parents uh, in uh, the preface to his book on miracles. It's about a meteorite. Among the hills, a meteorite lies huge, and moss has overgrown, and wind and rain with touches light made soft the contours of the stone. Thus easily can earth digest a cinder of sidereal fire and make her translunary guest the native of an English shire. Nor is it strange these wanderers find in her lap their fitting place, for every particle that's hers came at the first from outer space. All that is earth once has been sky. Down from the sun of old she came, or from some star that travelled by, too close to his entangling flame. Hence, if belated drops yet fall from heaven, on these her plastic power still works as once it worked on all the glad rush of the golden shower. Now I hope that what I may have read to you and spoken about during the course of the last hour or so will give you maybe a rather different impression of Lewis than you might have had from other quarters. Inevitably, as direct knowledge of someone of his stature gets expunged, the memory of the man is based on his writings, of course. So I'm particularly glad to have had this chance to share my feelings about Lewis with you. Many C.S. Lewis societies are set up throughout the world. Of course, this one, distinguished one of yours, David, is one here. In 1975, very shortly before his own death, my father paid a tribute to his friend Lewis at a special meeting at Oxford of the Magdalen College. And I'd like to conclude by just reading a few sections of what he said then. He, of course, was a contemporary and lifelong friend of Jack. I was a mere godson. So to some extent, what my father said about him is perhaps closer to the truth than I've been able to get. He said, like all who read his books or were privileged to enjoy his conversation, I learnt very much from him, though others have made profounder studies of his works and been more deeply influenced by them, including many in this room, I believe. My own great debt to him, if it could not, it could not be greater, was that of an abiding friendship, which defied all differences of opinion, outlook and interests. I find that many of the experiences which live most vividly in my memory are those which I shared with him. I remember one of my early sojourns at the Kilns, Oxford, when there had been a heavy fall of snow in the night with no wind. We went out in the morning into a world transformed. Everything bore its replica in white. We tried to find words to express the beauty and the silence of this new world but ended speechless before it. At the other end of our meetings, on the last occasion when he was well enough to pay us a visit in my home in Sussex, we were assailed after the sunset by one of those tremendous storms when thunder and lightning were almost instantaneous and the whole house was wrapped in blinding flashes of light. We sat in a darkened room with open windows, overwhelmed by the sheer power of the elements. Jack said afterwards he had rarely been so frightened and had never so much enjoyed being frightened. An almost equally memorable occasion was when I spent a weekend with him in Magdalen during the war. He had just discovered the works of that incomparable novelist of high life, Mrs. Amanda Ross. We read one of her books to each other in turn until convulsions overcame the reader and we, we ended literally rolling together on the floor in one of those paroxysms of painful laughter which unfortunately rarely visit one after one grows up. He was at his best on walking tours when his delight in nature vied with his enjoyment of conversation, in which, of course, he took the leading part. 
The day's walk had to be carefully planned so that we reached an inn about one o'clock. He held sandwiches in anathema, as one of his printed letters testifies. There were grand tours with a muster of six or seven, but I remember well two or three walks we took alone. One was down the Wye Valley on the borders of Wales, then a pretty remote place. And as we came down from the hills to see Tintern Abbey, he shouted for joy that the hedges were still as Wordsworth had described them. These hedges, hardly hedges, little lines of sportive wood run wild. And whenever I read those lines, I hear Jack declaiming them as we strode down the hill. Thank you very much. So, um, any questions? Um... Good. You want to stand it and. Oh, wait, 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 before, wait for the uh, microphone. We want you to use it as we record. <laughs> Did you have much interaction with Joy Davidman during her stay at the Counts? Who's that? Where's that coming from? No, none whatever. Uh, he, kept, he kept Joy. As you'd be surprised to hear, my father, who was his lifelong friend, never even met Joy Davidson. Now, that surprises a lot of people because uh, nor did, I think, Owen Barfield met him, met her once or twice, but not more than that. Um, there was a certain shyness about that relationship, and you will know from the film, if you went to see The Shadowlands, that his colleague Dons were, were surprised uh, at his decision to first of all, give her a civil marriage and then a, a proper marriage. Um, and I think he, he treated it as a very private thing as far as friends were concerned. I never met her. He referred to her in correspondence to me, as, as I've just heard, as just heard but, he, but I didn't ever meet her. And my father, nor did my father. So I'm afraid that I, I had, didn't have that privilege at all. No, I didn't go any of the walks because um, I was too young. Many people said, um, were the Narnia stories written for me? Well, the point was, I was about 27 when he first read his first Narnia story. <laughs> so I um, only learnt them myself when I read them to my own children. It was the first time I really understood the Narnia stories. He write, wrote a wonderful piece, a, a reply to an American lady. Uh, who had written asking a girl at a teacher's suggestion, um, what's, how, do you, how do you set about writing? Wanted advice on writing. And his reply was, he set out the steps to take. The first was turn off the radio, which includes everything else nowadays. <laughs> Read all the good books you can and avoid nearly all magazines. That does away with a lot of junk, doesn't it? Always write and read with the ear, not the eye. You should hear every sentence you write as if it was being read aloud or spoken. If it doesn't sound nice, try again. Four, write about what really interests you, whether it's real things or imaginary things, and nothing else. And notice, this means that if you are interested only in writing, you will never be a writer because you will have nothing to write about. <laughs> Five, take great pains to be clear. Remember that though you start by knowing what you mean, the reader doesn't, and a single ill-chosen word may well lead him to a total misunderstanding, misunderstanding. In a story, it is terribly easy just to forget that you have not told the reader something that, you, that he wants to know. The whole picture is so clear in your mind that you forget it. It isn't in the same in his. Six, when you give up a bit of work, and this is hopelessly bad, throw it away. Don't throw it away. Don't throw it away. Put it in a drawer. 
It may come in useful later. Much of my best work, he says, or what I think my best, is the rewriting of things begun and abandoned years earlier. Seven, don't use a typewriter or a computer, presumably. The noise will destroy your sense of rhythm, which still needs years of training. And finally, eight, be sure you know the meaning or meanings of every word you use. I have a question, Lawrence. When he was writing to you and you were writing to him, were you aware of how famous he was? It sounds like he never, and I've never had the sense that he did, ever talk about that. No, I, I had no idea. I knew he was a special man. He was one of my father's best friends. He, uh, he had no idea how famous I was going to be either. <laughs> well said. It's said that his lectures were, were governed by the capacity of his bladder, if I may. Um, during the duration of his lecture, he was governed by that. By the, um, which meant that he would sweep out of the lecture with his gown on, flying, on the dot after an hour, was up, uttering his final thoughts as he disappeared through the doorway. <laughs> and once relieved, he could be found again with a beer in his favourite hostelry, where most of the audience would then join him again and carry on with the session. <laughs> and I mentioned sandwiches. Uh, uh, on a walking tour, Jack would insist on on making it to a pub for lunch. On one such occasion, with my father and Owen Barfield, they found themselves at the critical lunch hour, barred from the nearest hostelry by a substantial hill with a railway tunnel running through it. My father and Barfield climbed the hill. Not so Lewis, who was determined to reach the pub in time for the essential pint of beer, and decided to risk the tunnel as the quickest way in the days of steam trains, that was. It was in the age of coal-fired coal, coal -fired steam engines. And when at last my father and Barfield arrived at the pub, there was Lewis, black from head to foot, <laughs> but triumphantly holding his pint. <laughs> Sorry, I stopped you, you can ask me. Uh, what was the effect on you of him asking you the questions in the letters, you as a young man? That's one of the best questions I've ever had. Um, I think it made me feel that I was capable of doing more than I otherwise would have been because of a man of his stature, even though I didn't know what stature that was, um, was prepared to presume that I knew better than him in any thing. Uh, I jolly would try to do something about it. Now, the rest as I wrote, of course, promptly destroyed, rightly so, by him. That happened, by the way, to all his correspondence. Once he'd answered, it was binned. That was it. So I had no idea what kind of letters I wrote to him. But I expect I rose to the challenge a bit and did occasionally say, yes, go on, read Oliver Twist again. I don't know whether I did or not. Um, but it, I think it made me feel a greater sense of importance. And I tell you what it also did. It made my siblings pretty jealous. <laughs> In fact, my, lis my sister once tried to steal the letters and tear them up and throw them away. These were my personal cache of Lewis letters, which I managed to stop her from doing. But, um, yeah, it, uh, it had an effect on me, there's no doubt. It was very empowering. Pardon? It was very empowering. Um, I don't know if you use the word empowering for a child quite, but I see what you mean. Yes, I think uh, you could say that. Yeah, good. <clears throat> Sir? Uh, you never met Joy. Did you um, ever meet uh, Douglas? Or I didn't even know there was a, an, another son. Yeah. But did, David. David, did you? David, uh, Meet them or know what came of them? I, I met Douglas once. In fact, I consulted him when I wrote this thing, well, by correspondence to make sure he was happy with my recollections. Um, but I only fleetingly spoken to him. I do not know him well. Far from it, I'm afraid. Melanie. Why do you think you had a connection with him uh, stronger than your siblings? Well, presumably because I was 
the fortunate one to be the godson. Uh, I had two brothers and two sisters. Uh, incidentally, my older brother's godfather was Owen Barfield, whom I've spoken about. So he, he did okay, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so to speak. And I mean, there is a special relationship between a godfather and godson. Well, there was in his case, the way he did it, because he, he took it very seriously. Um, he, he also great respect to my father and mother, and he came to see us often. Uh, I used to be very excited when he was coming, because I knew he was my godfather, not my siblings' godfather. <laughs> I think that's about what what caused that. Um, Lawrence, did, did Lewis ever indicate that um, his relationship with you and your siblings and your parents inspired him in his work, or was there anything that he said that he was dedicating to you or any, anything? No, I don't think so. He may have been, he may have been um, affected a bit <coughs> by playing with the five of us as children when he came to visit us. It was Owen Barfield's uh, Lucy to whom he dedicated the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Owen Barfield's daughter, foster daughter, foster daughter, who sadly had muscular sclerosis and a very sad life. But she was the Lucy to whom that book was dedicated. And um, throughout his time and friendship with Owen Barfield, they had this difference of opinion on the question of anthroposophy, called the Great War that they had with each other. A war of words, a war of writing, but a war of friendship which never ended up in any, anything else than friendship. And he said about Barfield that he could always win an argument with himself. And that took a bit of doing with Lewis, I can tell you. But he had the kind of brain and ability with his head, Owen Barfield, in a marvelous way to sort of succinctly get to the core of an issue and, and, and kill it dead, so to speak. And that was hugely respected by Lewis, which may be one of the reasons why he wanted his Barfield's daughter to have that dedication. I'm not aware that any of us had the same sort of effect on him as that. Can you say anything else about connections or antagonisms between Lewis and anthroposophy? There's something in the book about that, which if you read it, uh, you will find perhaps helpful. I find that difficult, that question, because I'm not quite clear in my mind precisely what the issue was. Barfield and my father were strong adherents to anthroposophy. Um, Anthroposophy is a, 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 um, a, a belief uh, that uh, originates from the philosophy of Rudolf Steiner, who was an Austrian philosopher at the turn of the last century, who influenced large numbers of people. Uh, he came into England uh, to talk about his beliefs, and it was on that occasion that my father and mother met him and persuaded that they should set up a school on his principles in London, which they then did in 1924. And they're, they're now all over the country, all over England, and there are many in, in America too. Waldorf, Waldorf schools, they're called. You've probably come across them. Waldorf schools, that's based on the principles of anthroposophy <laughs> and the, the principle of education that Waldorf schools espouse is that for the first formative years of a child's life, until 12, 13 or there, the humanities are the things that are taught, music, history, languages, uh, uh, and the scientific subjects follow when you've had a chance as a child to have a rounded view of the world from a humanitarian point of view, so that by the time you're 14, perhaps you're readier to take on the sciences than otherwise would be the case. I went through that system. It's the only system I have gone through. I'm probably a pretty poor example of the result, but um, <laughs> that's what I did do. And I'm coming back to your question, John, isn't it? Fancy me remembering that. Um, <laughs> I'm not so old as I thought I was. <laughs> um, 
there's a, there's a, I might even ask my wife to answer that question. Could you do that? No, she can't either. <laughs> read the book, read the book. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not dealt with the question very well, but um, it's better to have no answer than to have a foolish answer. <coughs> How long after his conversion to Christianity um, was he then your godfather? How long had he been? Well, I'm not quite sure when he was... When was the date of his conversion? I, I was born in 33. So safely, he was able to become a godfather, if you see what I mean. <laughs> oh, his age was dead. Mm. Well, no, but I wanted to know oh. that. I, I kind of wanted to know how long he'd been converted. Be, be oh, he'd, he yes, he'd been, he'd been a Christian for three years then. Three years. Is that right? And then did he speak to you about... No. Um, no, he made no attempts to direct my spiritual moves in any direction, whatever. Uh, he felt total confidence in my parents that that was their responsibility. And although he was a godfather in name, he treated that responsibility in the way I hope I've described by some of the things I've talked to you about tonight. There can't be any more questions. Uh, if I may follow up on that, that question. Um, You've said what you've said, but did he at all speak with you about the transition that he made from being an atheist to a man of great faith? No, no. Um. I know that when it was the centennial of C.S. Lewis's birth, some were disappointed that England really didn't celebrate it much. As we come up to the 50-year anniversary of his death, is there any talk of Cambridge or Oxford or England itself recognizing that in any grand way? It's an interesting question, that, because in many ways in your country here, he's better known and better celebrated than he is in the UK. I think you've got a more searching intelligence, by and large, across the water here than the stuffy Brits have across the water the other way. Um, that was noted, incidentally, both when my father came over here to give talks occasionally and when Owen Barfield came over as well. He said <coughs> to me that the attention he got to some of his talks on philosophical matters was wonderful in, in America and was not anything like as good in England. I don't know the reason for that. I think his college, um, both the one he was a don at and University College where he was at... Um, when he was a student, will doubtless do their best to celebrate that occasion. But I've heard no news of anything more than that on any sort of national scale, uh, even though perhaps you might say it's my job to do something about it. Is that what you, <laughs> <laughs> Is that what your trap was laying for me? <laughs> ah, bullseye. <laughs> oh, dear. I think people have enough, haven't they? One more question. Okay. Are there The hideous strength. I love his hideous. Uh, what's the one? Uh, his imagery in his in his science fictional books. There's some wonderful descriptions of you know magical descriptions of of science fiction, and I think that's a masterly book myself. Mm. Mm. We have copies of that hideous strength out here, <laughs> by the way, which is the third volume of his so-called space trilogy. Um, and I agree, uh, those of you who have not read it, it was heavily influenced by uh, Charles Williams um, as far as the approach he used in the imagery and so forth. Um, I hope everyone here gets a chance to pick up um, Lawrence's book. We were able to get it at a real great price, um, and Lawrence brings a uh, a sense and a personal connection and uh, I think a sweetness that um, is I think very heartwarming and something that uh, everyone should have in their own families um, but also for someone who has been so influential as Lewis and is so important in my opinion more than ever um, in our rather secular uh, postmodern world. 
So I want to thank Lawrence, if you would join with me again for um, thanking him. I also want to thank all of you for uh, joining with us. Uh, I hope the A's traffic didn't get in the way. Uh, and also, by the way, um, uh, for anyone interested, this is our the Independent Review is the quarterly journal of the Independent Institute, and there are free copies out there on the registration table. And uh, there are copies of Lawrence's book and many of, of, of Lewis's books and so forth. So thank you for coming. Um, have a good, safe drive back. God bless you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Lawrence.